Hi, so this is a session for you as a um, uh, recorded video session to cover for the one where I didn't get a chance to do with you because we are only in alternate days. And um, I tried to do this as a Google Meet, but ended up having to interrupt it for a phone call. And so, um, yeah, here's a shortened version of the lesson I've done with the other two classes, just for you, block five. Um, so we're thinking about another strand of socialism, and we've been thinking so far about revolutionary socialism. Uh, today is democratic socialism. Next week, we're looking at social democracy and third way socialism, or what we sometimes think of as new labor. Okay. Um, and at this point, then, we're thinking about differences between different types of socialism and the way in which we can fit those into the se second and third paragraphs of our 24 mark question. So what are we talking about? I'm not going to play this video for you. You can play it yourself in your own time. Um, but it's AOC. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you will know her probably as um, one of the most left-wing members of the Democrats in Congress and somebody who describes herself as a democratic socialist. And here she is on the Stephen Colbert show talking about what it means to her. And what you'll see her talk about is that it means things like uh, guaranteeing education to children, uh, making sure people have got enough money to live on, making sure that um, people have got access to health care, in other words, we're not talking about something massively radical. We're talking about things that most people want. And that's the clue, isn't it, about democratic socialism. We've moved from revolutionary socialism, something which most people want, but which is, in revolutionary socialist mind, good for most people, to democratic socialism, which most people can be won to, even though it's not necessarily going to create lots of fundamental change all at once. Perhaps it will over time. Okay, you can read more about that um, later on uh, when you're not watching this video. Uh, there's a little link there to the Democratic Socialists of America who are a faction within the Democrats. And what we're reminding ourselves here, here is there's a little synoptic link from this little bit uh, that we're talking about with socialism to something we're going to consider with the US political parties later. Oh, there you go, synoptic link. Uh, so we're going to try and do this then in these next, hmm, however long it takes me to do this. I always say about 15 minutes, but probably slightly longer to consider what we mean by democratic socialism, to do so through looking at the ideas of a democratic socialist a thinker, uh, Beatrice Webb, and to consider how other people will um, think about this, how they might evaluate it, particularly how the differences between these and revolutionary socialists. In the lesson with the other two classes, I asked them these questions. We came up with some uh, really good ideas. Um, for number one, people said, you know, there hasn't been a revolution in Britain because um, of false consciousness, because, you know, people are too easily persuaded by the tabloid press, or Rupert Murdoch or whoever it happens to be. Or maybe it was because we've got quite a lot of reforms already. So there hasn't been a need for revolution because people have won the NHS and they've won a welfare state. And we talked about conservatism there, actually, you know, how people like Edmund Burke in you looked at with Don talked about the idea that a nation without the means of some change is without the means of its own conservation. And you have to change to conserve. And even conservatives will accept some social reform to avoid a revolution. When we've thought about why shouldn't there be a revolution, we've been thinking about, or people have suggested, um, the undesirable consequences of revolutions, civil war, terror, bloodshed, disruption, tumult, Given the opportunity, most people want a quiet life, don't they? Most people don't want to live within a civil war. When it comes to three, I suppose, you know, why won't there be a revolution in Britain? We could argue that there is no longer a kind of sufficiently large enough revolutionary left, even if there was one. Uh, that people aren't any longer motivated by class in the same way that we might have thought about the Russian Revolution or other revolutions at the same time. When it comes to what would need to happen if there were to be a revolution, well, those ingredients, so they'd have to be uh, a sufficiently organised working class capable of controlling the means of production. They'd have to be a revolutionary party of uh, organised uh, intellectuals who are, who are rooted in the working class. There'd have to be some sort of crisis. And at this point, some people suggested, well, I wonder whether COVID could, could present the kind of crisis uh, that leads to a revolutionary situation. You know, because it's always going to be like an external shock, which kind of like changes people's perception of their place in society, but also makes what seemingly was impossible all of a sudden possible. So we've had a bit of fun thinking about the way in which people have begun to think about, actually, we do. We can actually have, you know, like manage to pay people for staying at home and spending time not working if we want to. 
Uh, we can also like eradicate homelessness overnight if we want to. Okay. But anyway, democratic socialists are mainly thinking about why we don't have a revolution. I haven't had a revolution and also don't need a revolution. While we're thinking about this and thinking about different types of socialists, one of the things I wanted to do with this session was to introduce another way of looking at socialists. And it's, it's some, something that when you're considering in the exam differences between them, this is another way of splitting them up because democratic socialists, just like revolutionary socialists, can be called fundamentalist. Why? Well, it's because they actually want to get rid of capitalism and they want to replace it with a socialist society based upon equal distribution and abolishing private property and so on. So that's something they share in common, unlike revisionist socialists who want to keep capitalism. Um, and I reminded people that Neil Kinnock, who was the leader of the Labour Party before Tony Blair, used to say, we don't want to get rid of capitalism. We just want to run it better than the capitalists, nicer than the capitalists, more equally than the capitalists. So those other two, social democracy and the third way, are people who really disagree with the fundamentalist socialists about the ends that they're pursuing. And this is really useful for a 24 mark question, which you'll sometimes get, which says something like, evaluate the view that the, the big disagreements, biggest disagreements in, between socialists are about their means rather than their ends. And you've got, you know, something to play with on both sides of that question. Anyway, more about democratic socialists and what's distinctive about them. Okay, so we're going to say that there are different types in here. And I'm pointing you to the handout here with a little yellow bubble there, which gives you a little chart to look at four different types of democratic socialists, um, considering these different types. Now, normally I get people to look at this uh, using the text. And I've put uh, three different texts in the Socialism Google site for you to, to use. And where it says Haywood, then uh, that's the Essential Political Ideas by Andy Haywood. There's a chapter from him and there's the Kelly one as well. We're going to make most use of those. So here we're thinking about different types, including ethical socialists who think we should have socialism just because it's nicer. Uh, municipal socialists who think we should use local councils to deliver socialism. Euro communists who are, I suppose you can really just think of them as like, uh, Labour Party people plus who want to be even more left wing than the Labour Party but just don't want a revolution. And even we'll begin to consider social democrats, although that's really next week's job because I've just put them in the revisionist thing. But it's often really difficult to tell the difference between democratic socialists and social democrats because they're both employing the same means. They're both bof often, both often in the same parties. And indeed, you could even make an argument they're even inside the same heads. Is Jeremy Corbyn a fundamentalist socialist or a social democrat? Does he really want to get rid of capitalism? Well, he sometimes says that he does, but lots of his manifesto things are things which aren't getting rid of it, just making it much more equal or trying to um, redistribute wealth. So that's why there's sometimes a bit of an overlap for those. Anyway, democratic socialists, that's what we're looking at here. So four types then. Principally, our key features of democratic socialism are going to be that it involves common ownership. That means nationalisation. That means the state taking over what, after the Second World War, people called the commanding heights of the economy. So in 1945, we took over coal, rail, steel, even sugar, airlines, public transport, like kind of buses and things, uh, telephones eventually when they came along for everybody, gas, electric, water, everything was owned by the state common ownership in order to guarantee full employment and to make sure that the profits are redistributed. That redistribution also takes place for fundamentalist socialists through taxation, through increasingly taking money from people who are wealthy and then spreading it around through resources and uh, services, things like leisure and all sorts of things. So that, so that we're abolishing private property by taking some of that private property away from uh, those people who've accumulated most of it. Planning is a feature of, of democratic socialism. And the idea that instead of letting the market dictate uh, how resources are distributed, uh, instead we're going to identify what the needs are and then use those things that we've taken control of, those industries that we've taken control of, uh, to calculate how many people, how much stuff we need to produce to meet those needs. It's defiantly anti-revolutionary, this democratic socialism. And I'll explain why later on, but it's to do with the unde undesirability of revolution. To be to, to the argument that it's counterproductive. 
And there's a logic to the idea that, you know, you can gradually create socialism. They've got the means to create socialism now in a democratic society, which is where Beatrice Webb comes in. And I'll talk about her in a moment. But there are some other types of democratic socialism. So we often talk about ethical socialism, people who think about socialism being the right thing to, uh, to achieve because it's nicer than capitalism. Capitalism is based on sin. It's based on greed. You know, it's not right that some tiny few people, uh, 0.001%, accumulate so much wealth, avarice, piling it up in their uh, bank accounts uh, while other people are going without. And actually, the, the aims of socialism might seem to be morally superior because they're about identifying a common humanity, a fraternalism, uh, where we see each other, look out for each other, have a solidarity with each other. Um, that's a kind of like the Bible, isn't it? Like Christianity, do unto others as you would have done unto you, love thy neighbor, etc. And this even extends into kind of religion. So in South America, for example, perhaps in other elements of the Catholic Church as well, you get this kind of idea of liberation theology is that uh, priests ministering to their local congregations by uh, embracing the ideas of equality and redistribution of, uh, of wealth as being the right and Christian thing to do. Now, of course, this ethical socialism isn't necessarily exclusive, mutually exclusive from the fundamentalist stuff we've been looking at before. It motivates all sorts of socialists. This Euro-communism thing is a feature which is much more prevalent in places like, or was prevalent in places like France and Italy and Spain than it is in the UK. But nonetheless, it involves communist parties, which, for example, in France, which had been the leaders of the resistance. Uh, and by the time we get to the end of the Second World War, the most popular parties in France, who had previously been in favour of revolution, but who now believe that actually, uh, having become so popular, that it should be possible for them to seize control of the liberal bourgeois state and then deliver socialism in much the same way as the other socialist parties, but just further and faster and quicker. Either way, it's an electoral strategy. Finally, we have got to talk about this social democracy. And it's, as I mentioned before, it's about the means they use because they're almost indistinguishable from the fundamentalist socialists. So commanding heights of the economy, enlarging the state, managing it so that we ensure full employment. You would be hard pressed in, in terms of looking at the means to determine which were social democrats and which were democratic socialists within the Labour Party. But we'll leave those for next lesson, okay? So let's have a think about Beatrice Webb. Now, uh, I'll save you the stories, which I, I'll tell you, you have to ask me those in class next time about the kind of clause four and how everybody who joined the Labour Party in the 1980s could recite it for you. But this is uh, the most important clause of the Labour Party's constitution, clause four. And it was written by Beatrice Webb and her husband, Sidney Webb. So when the Labour Party stopped being the Labour Representation Committee, but rebranded itself as a proper national party seeking to win control of government, it had a constitution and this was at the heart of it. And this was stayed in the constitution for 70 years until Blair got rid of it um, because of the way in which it commits the party to socialism, to fundamentalist socialism. And in the class, I've asked people, what is there in here that's really socialist? And I'll tell you now, I don't think I can muck about with the PowerPoint to kind of highlight them, but full fruits of their industry, right? Securing for the workers the full fruits of their industry. There's an acknowledgement there that currently under capitalism, workers don't get the full fruits of their industry. They get the surplus value stolen from them. The most equitable distribution thereof, there's an implication there that in capitalism, there isn't an equitable distribution. There's an unfair distribution according to the market. So what we're going to have instead is a fair share for all. Common ownership of the means of production distribution and exchange but that's the state nationalizing things in order to guarantee that people get their fair share so those are the socialist bits but i asked people then okay what in here is different from the revolutionary socialism we've been looking at before and if you look carefully there's a couple of really good examples and i'm saying this by the way i'm using this text on purpose because i think you can use this uh, as an example of what beatrice webb wrote in order to show the differences here they are very small, okay? Let's take the last one, popular administration. We know that administrations are popular when they are elected. So here, the implication is that any government that's gonna deliver this kind of socialism is going to be democratically elected. It'll have won the support of most people in order to be able to do that. It'll have taken the people with them. Secondly, it's to secure for the workers by hand or by brain. 
In other words, not by the workers, but for the workers. The workers can stay at work and carry on doing what they're doing and, you know, race their whippets or go to the pub in the evening. The business of delivering socialism is going to be by a party, a parliamentary party, which is influenced by uh, smart intellectuals of, uh, of, a, of a socialist persuasion like Beatrice Webb, uh, who are educated, who are going to be able to plan and manage the economy on behalf of the workers rather than by themselves. So you'll see already this is completely different from the way in which Marxists and revolutionary socialists talk about self-emancipation of the working class or the idea that workers have got to be involved in this kind of revolutionary struggle because that's what's going to change their consciousness. Here, none of that is necessary for Beatrice Webb. We just need to elect the right kind of government. Okay. Uh, I've given you a little bit of work to do here, looking at Kelly and looking at these four words. And if you look in the handout that accompanies this uh, PowerPoint, you'll see that I'm asking you to explain these words. I'll do it for you briefly here, though. Because Beatrice Webb's uh, commitment, first, is to gradualism. She talks about this inevitability of gradualism. Why? Well, it's because revolutions themselves are undesirable. It's like we were talking about at the beginning. They involve civil war, violence, terror, threat, tumult, economic uh, catastrophe, at least in the short term. They're also unpredictable. They're also one um, putting society on the basis where it's really difficult to plan how to redistribute resources if you're in the middle of civil wars and conflict. They're chaotic and don't necessarily give you the result that you want. You might lose. Uh, and if you lose, then you're likely to suffer even worse consequences. They're also inefficient and counterproductive. That in, the, in creating disruption, they might actually alienate you from the workers. They might make you less popular and less capable of delivering the things which you want to do. You might end up taking measures against the, uh, the people, the very people you're supposed to be supporting. And she also argued, I accidentally put in three ends there. She also argued that they're unnecessary. That, in fact, we don't need to use violence in order to seize control of the state because by the 1890s and 1900s, when she's work, uh, writing, workers can vote. They can elect. All workers are able to vote. All male workers are able to vote by the time we get there. Okay, So um, they're unnecessary because we have the vote. Therefore, if we have the vote, we can capture the state by simply electing a government to then pass legislation which will uh, create socialism. And this is the big difference, again, between uh, Beatrice Webb and revolutionary socialists, because revolutionaries, Marxists, would have argued that the state is nothing but the executive committee for conducting the affairs of the bourgeoisie. And since it's dominated by the ruling class, it has to be smashed in order to then create a new worker state which is going to deliver things, these things. Beatrice Webb says that's not necessary. Instead, what we can do is elect a government which can then populate the state. It can put people in the jobs of the state who will deliver socialism, and they'll do so by rational planning in each department. Uh, in that way, we'll be able to get rid of all of the worst features of capitalism by passing legislation which educates the workers, which gives them more opportunities to be able to get uh, jobs which, which feed them properly, by having a welfare state which provides for people and prevents them from suffering the worst consequences of capitalism, and by having trade unions which can protect people's wages and workers' rights. Okay, all of this sounds like a more peaceful way of getting what we want. What is uh, the problem? And this is where I'm asking you to do a little bit of homework. And in your handout, you'll see homework. There's a little grid. It's got uh, each of these steps, each of these stages that Beatrice Webb described. And what I'm asking you to do is think about ways in which revolutionary socialists would criticize this. Because like it or not, this didn't work. So the idea is that democratic socialist parties campaign to win the trust of the workers in an election campaign. The workers realize, based on that education, that capitalism is not in their interests. They vote in a radical socialist government. That socialist government introduces public ownership, which inevitably improves the situation of workers. And workers now, benefiting from full employment and better wages, keep electing socialist governments. And when they do so, that society becomes more socialist with each reform. So each successive Labour government or socialist government makes society less capitalist. Here, I've accidentally realised that uh, what I should say is, would make a return to capitalism unlikely. 
Now, all of this sounds great. So what's the problem? Um, and you could probably pick some things out anyway. What is it that stopped Corbyn getting elected? Well, he presented such a threat to um, finance capital and to, you know, arguably to the ruling class in Britain that um, all of the major means of intellectual production, all of the major media networks and newspapers um, persuaded workers that actually he shouldn't be trusted instead. What if he'd got elected, though? The chances are then that lots of businesses would have taken their money out of the country, they'd have gone on a kind of financial strike, uh, or even that there might have been an attempt to uh, stop him from being in power any longer. This happened. We've got an, evidence, an example for this, and it's in Chile in 1973. So the Chilean 1973 version of Corbyn was this man, Salvador Allende. And Salvador Allende's career ended when he was murdered by um, the Chilean army, which in itself was supported by the Chilean ruling class and also by uh, the CIA. And there was nothing kind of really radical or revolutionary about Salvador Allende. He just wanted some land reforms to re redistribute land to some peasants, and he wanted to increase workers' rights and um, and redistribute through some taxation and some nationalization as well. But nothing kind of uh, revolutionary. But fearing that their control of the Chilean uh, capitalist system was going to be threatened, um, the Chilean ruling class reacted by uh, not only attacking his government and storming his palace and dropping bombs on his palace um, using the air force, but rounding up tens of thousands of members of the Socialist Party in Chile into a football stadium in Santiago and torturing them, murdering some of them, uh, disappearing some of them by dropping their corpses into the ocean. Thousands of people fled to Europe. I knew some people in Newcastle who hosted Chilean refugees who were not remotely radical. They were just normal kind of democratic socialist type people who had failed to, to recognize um, what R.H. Tawney described when he talked about how you, how you try and achieve socialism. He says this great phrase, R.H. Tawney. You remember, he's the one about pikes and minnows. He says, you can peel an onion skin by skin, but you can't skin a tiger claw by claw because the tiger fights back and bites your head off. So that is a clue as to what you can write as to why reformist socialism or democratic socialism often fails and what revolutionary socialists might say in response. Okay. Uh, after that, oh, I was going to say then, I've left in here um, a link for you to read a little bit more. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Uh, for you to read a little bit more about uh, democratic socialism. So you can look at those two links there. That's particularly good, the one about the democratic socialists in the USA, because it's useful for looking at American stuff when we come to look at the Democratic Party. And also a little um, uh, revolutionary socialist analysis of um, the Chilean coup in 1973. So you can use that as an example. Okay. Any questions? Then you'll just let me know, won't you? Okay. And uh, I'll see you next time.